Now, Hope, Healing, and Help with Ron Harder, sponsored by Heritage Oaks Memorial Chapel. Welcome. This is Ron Harder, and you're listening to Hope, Healing, and Help. And I'm here to share with you how you can deal with your grief and move from mourning to joy. We come to you as fellow travelers on the journey of grief. Folks, we have been through a lot of losses in our life. The first one that I want to speak about is Zachary, my son in 2006, who drowned, then both my parents, and then a number of good friends. And all of those losses were different losses, but they were important, and the things we learned through them, we'd like to share. We want you to know today that you're not alone, and today we're going to give you some more tools to help you on your journey. I have on the phone with me the author R. Glenn Kelly. Uh, I know him as Ron, and we met at a bereaved parents gathering in Indianapolis late last month, and I so appreciated how much he had to share about his grief and how men and women grieve differently. We had him on last week, and uh, we invited him to come back because he still has more things to share with us about this important topic. Welcome to the show, Ron. Oh, thank you, Ron. It, it, it's such an honor to be here. Praise God and bless you for having me. Well, we appreciate you too. And I was blessed by what you had to say at the gathering. I know that you're willing to uh, really delve into some areas that sometimes we don't touch on that much. And of course, I think your experience has been that not a whole lot of people are talking about how men and women grieve. No, it seems to be a taboo issue. Uh, and understandably, um, okay. it, it's a, uh, you know, if you ever have somebody who, um, uh, has lost somebody. I know you and I have been through it, too. We get the phone calls, well, how is so-and-so, and how is so-and-so, and nobody ever asks how we are. Yes. They ask, how is the wife? How are the siblings? Um, how am I? And, and nobody asks that question. Isn't that an interesting thing? You know, like it's almost an assumption that maybe we don't grieve quite the way the rest of the family does. And and we do, don't we? We, we absolutely do. And, and I... And I'll just say real quick, we had mentioned last week with, you know, studies of the brain mapping show that, that men have twice the emotion that women do. We just do it all internally. We, yeah. do not, we do not show our emotions as much on the outside as women do. Well, you have an interesting story about your son, Jonathan, and his birth and the issues he had with his health and finally his passing. Would you just kind of review that again with our audience so that people uh, who didn't listen last week know why you're here? Oh, I would love to. I, I enjoy speaking about Jonathan so much. He was such a hero. He was he was born in 1997 with a condition known as hypoplastic left heart syndrome. And in short term, that just means that the, the left side of his heart failed to develop in the womb. Um, we didn't know about it until birth. And, of course, uh, shortly after he was delivered on that very same day, he was handed to us, and we were told that he might not make it through the night. I uh, didn't expect him to. Uh, he had different plans, and God had different plans for amen. him. Amen. <laughs> God, but yes, amen. And God would eventually deliver, uh, I say eventually, but almost immediately deliver an amazing surgeon to us who would restructure Jonathan's heart through a series of open-heart surgeries to function on a two-chamber heart. Uh, because of that, he was able to live a, a relatively normal life. You know, he could play basketball in the yard, but he'd have to sit down and rest before the other kids did. But other than that, he had uh, a wonderful life. We had a wonderful life in the church and with family and friends, and at 16 years of age, uh, he went in for a heart catheterization just uh, to see how he was doing inside, and maybe, you know, and physicians will, will forgive me for saying this, but maybe tweak some little things here and there, um, and yes, I called him my $6 million boy, uh, <laughs> uh, and he made it to the, the uh, heart catheterization just fine, but while he was in recovery, uh, his precious little heart failed, and, and Jesus called him home. You talked also about the legacy that he left. Can you just touch on that for a moment? Sure. You know, his condition, hypoplastic left heart syndrome, is a rare heart condition. Uh, it is certainly not as rare as I wish that it was. Um, but he had uh, miraculous uh, recoveries, and, and a lot of that, and we discussed it last week, I think a lot had to do with prayer, with our pastor, with a number of different things. But um, you know, where they expected him to be down for two or three weeks, within four or five days, he's bouncing up and down in the hospital crib, and they're, they're screaming to get him out of there, <laughs> get him out of our hospital, take him home. But they did a lot of research. To say that he had records is incorrect. He had tombs of medical records uh, done on him. Yeah. And 
I always said that, that uh, you know, he had served so many other children that were born after him with the same condition. And, you know, John made it to 16 and a half. Maybe because of him, another makes it to 17. And, and you can't look at a parent and say, you know, because only God knows the number of our days, but you can't look at a parent and say, okay, yours is going to have 17. Enjoy it, you know, yeah. realize it's one more than I... But, but that means a lot to me, that, that maybe someone born after him is going to live to 20 and 25, and, and maybe maybe a full life. So John had served so many others out there that he never had a chance to meet. He knows them now, of course, but he never got a chance to meet them while he was here on earth with us. Right. And you have 16 good years of memories. 16 years longer than they said that we could have. Oh, God, God gave us that. Yeah, and that's something. Well, I know through that whole process, God was at work in your life, and and you developed a personal relationship with him through Jesus Christ. Just touch on that briefly, if you would. I did, and and again, it was it was last week you and I discussed that. But in a Keystone Cops kind of manner, I think God chased me around for most of my life, and and uh, you just have to picture that old black and white of cops chasing each other around the car, and uh, <laughs> and finally, and and while John was still alive, um, and because of some of the blessings that God brought into my life while John was still alive, I I stopped and. I recognize that uh, Jesus is our Savior, and when I did, God came into my life fully. Isn't that awesome? Praise God. And I, I think that's made a big difference for you, hasn't it? It has. Even in my recovery, even in my recovery it has. I tell people all the time that, that you know, every time that the, the bottom drops out in our life, and, and this is certainly the, the bottom I don't want to drop out in anybody's life, but when the bottom drops out, we drop into our, our self-worth, and our self-worth is... is the, the 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 knowledge that God says that we are a child of God, and that's that's what we hang on to that we are loved, and He's a yes. good Father, and He and He cares about us, and He's there for us. Well, now, really, one one really cool thing I like to say is sure. that 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 we all have our individual plans with God, and when my son was up there, and God said it's time for you to go down to Earth for a little while, He looked down at me and said, "Hey." there's somebody worthy for you to go spend 16 years with. So what does that tell me that God thinks of me? Well, praise God. It puts a lot of value in your life, doesn't it? It does. It, it does. gives me a lot of faith and yeah. comfort. Amen. So we started last week talking about how men and we, men and women grieve differently. And uh, let's, let's talk about that more and a little bit about some of the differences on how men and women process grief. And uh, let's, let's work some more on that, shall we? Certainly, certainly. Well, you know what, and, and let's recap real quick, because I think sure. last week I touched on the fact that, that men grieve equally as women do. Sure. Uh, you know, we would all talk in generality. Some of us are, are um, you know, uh, some women are taller than men, but generally men are taller than women, uh, things like that. So we broad brush some things. But in general, uh, men grieve more internally, and, and women will grieve and, and be more empathetic on the outside. And because of those differences, sometimes it could be... Um, you know, misconstrued in a way uh, in between couples. And if we don't touch on it again, just remember what I said last week, uh, only 15% of couples that have a loss end up in divorce, and they, they, they really discovered that even that 15% had underlying conditions before their profound loss that led to a divorce. So it's God in love, and it will keep us together. You know, but that, I was we, going to we, ask a question. I was going to make a comment. You know, I, I know that as men grieve... I mean, I've watched it. I mean, sometimes it's just absolutely overwhelming yeah. in, for men, as it is for women. What do men do with that overwhelming grief? Well, as, as a, a generality, we, we get to that external expression of grief, and that's good. But for the most part, we have a tendency to try to grieve internally because we are systemizers and organizers. And, and this came to us, uh, and it began as soon as we walked out of the Garden of Eden uh, because we had to survive. Um, and because we were, were bigger and stronger than the female, and the, the female played a separate role, the, the, the male took on one of survival, which meant, um, and if you, if you can picture this in your mind, I mean, picture those days where the, the man had to go on a hunt. Um, and on that hunt, he might be gone and in solitude for, for weeks and months at a time. And many times he was hunting animals that would eat him if he were to do it wrong. You, you understand what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah, I, I get you. So, you know, he's actually afraid why he's out there. So while he's, he's, he's hiding, he's in solitude, he's stoic, and he's repressing emotions. He's got to. He can't let that fear come out. 
So, I mean, if you can take that and, and start that onto the journey and, and now realize that not only did he have to eat, but he also had to sleep. That's part of our purposes, is that we eat, sleep, and God told us that we will reproduce. So your, your first three generalities are eat, sleep, and reproduce. Sleeping meant that he had to provide comfort and, and a place to survive back at home. So as he did that, he became a toolmaker and a systemizer and a builder and, and a number of different things. While all of that allowed us to, to really get to, I think the point you and I are going to get to are the little boxes inside of our brain where we, we have a tendency to organize things in our brain and take them out at the time. Uh, women, of course, are more empathetic because if we go back to that same time and, and all through history, women have been the ones that have cared for our children. And there's not a woman out there who could deny that she could look at a newborn baby that can't say a word and be able to tell what that child needs. And, and that's empathy. And if we go back to some of the older days, we realize that when uh, women uh, were to marry uh, a man, they were given to a man and, and taken away from her own village and taken to a new village where the man is still around his family and, and the people that he's grown up with. She's taken to a new village, and now she's got to look at the feelings of everybody else around her as part of her survival. So women have developed to be far more empathetic than men and to express their emotions on the outside. So what we get, unfortunately, as we go through, uh, and that's the nature part of it, because I think you were there when I talked about both nature and nurture. Uh, one of the longest disputed psychological arguments there's ever been is, is whether or not we're by nature or we're by nurture. Um, when, when you and I are, are born as children, we come into a world where we're told big boys don't cry and, and don't show your emotions and only the strongest survive. Um, and nature takes over and programs us to be that, that stoic, less emotional person. And, you know, and to just to inject something here, I, I think that's a good thing because, you know, we have to go on in life and provide for our families and to build things and develop things and, and even sometimes uh, fend for our loved ones. So yeah. it's good that we do have those skills and knowledge. Uh, it's sad when guys don't get that because there's not a dad around, but I think dads really provide that. They do. They do. And again, you know, I think it's all part of his design. I think it's for a reason. And, yeah. and a lot of the reason I believe that is because of what you just said. I mean, there are certain roles that we have to play in life, and it's, it's, uh, it's roles of being the provider. It's, it's roles of being the nurturer. Um, we're the provider, and, and nurturing is also needed. I've always said, and, and you know, uh, it is funny how we've changed as a culture. Where before, let's say, 1920, 1930, you and I would have grown up uh, with our fathers and been with our fathers every day, all day long in the fields, learning how to, to, to hoe a field, learning how to milk a cow, learning how to, to pick up the eggs. But in 1920, 1930, guess what happened to our fathers? They went they off were, to the factories, right? They went off to the factories. They went off to the office buildings. And, and suddenly we were without our, our role models every day. So a young child, a young child of six or seven years old as a boy, or even the girls, you know, without a role model, they're going to look for somebody to tell them who they are going to be. And if they're not in church or they're not around a strong, positive role model, they're going to pick whoever's there. And isn't that why a lot of young people join gangs? It is, because they are looking for somebody to tell them who they're going to be. And, and unfortunately, they're not in front of God. Yes. So, and, and, but I, I, you know, I, I go off the beaten path a bit. Yeah, but I think we have kind of removed some of that, too, because I think the school has provided some of that ad in, the, in the past, at least. And mm -hmm. I think we also had some of that in our neighborhoods, the relationships with other families and other men. Oh, our, our civic and, events were filled with it. Our, our Boy Scout gatherings, yeah, our, our little league. You know, every, yeah. Everything at one time was filled with God. So. Yeah, yeah. And and that's all kind of changed, you know. I think that, it, and it's sad because um, we we have a whole generation of young men, I'm afraid, that don't have what they need. But let's talk about the guy now. He, he's got this inherent ability to compartmentalize, and so all of a sudden this overwhelming grief hits him. Mm -hmm. What's he do? Well, he is going to compartmentalize it first. He is going to, uh, you know, that grief is in there. I always say that, that men have a series of boxes in their mind, and, and they keep everything in a specific box. You know, there's a box for the house and a box for the car and a box for the, 
uh, you know, the job and a box for this and a box for that. And every time that uh, you want to talk about a subject, I have to open up that box and bring out that subject and we talk about it. There is a box for grief. However, that box, especially early in our loss, cannot be closed. It's a, it's a very overwhelming box. Uh, but it's also right there astride the fact that, that we have these natural instincts to, to to make sure we are doing what needs to be done. Now, I can speak from personal experience and a number of people I've interviewed that, again, I don't want to say it was a joyous thing, but I was somewhat relieved that I had things I could do immediately after John passed. And that's putting all together everything that had to be done so that services would be uh, in honor of him. And, and bless the church for being there as well. But, you know, I knew that I was a leader of that. I wanted that. That occupied my mind. But as soon as those duties were gone, that box that I kept the grief in, it didn't want to stay closed. It, you know, you couldn't just pull it out when it's time to think about the grief. And as we know from, from being out there and, and working with so many conferences and, and uh, workshops and such, I mean, grief comes in waves, um, and it has to be dealt with. It does, and I think if somebody puts a lid on that box and says, I'm not going to deal with it, I am just going to repress it, now they're creating another problem, aren't they? Yes, and, and repressed grief is, is one of my biggest issues. As we discussed last week, I recognized it for the first six months I went through a period of repressed grief, and everybody knows that we have both a, a conscious mind and a subconscious mind. The, the subconscious mind being that part of your mind that allows your heart to beat 100,000 or 100,000 times a day in your your lungs inflate and deflate 75,000 times a day. It works on your behalf without your telling it to. So if we have all these conscious feelings of, of you know, uh, pain, anger, uh, guilt, uh, the number of just different emotions that come along with grief, and, and we don't let those emotions out, and we keep holding them inside, eventually they're going to go where? They're going to go back to your subconscious. And, and what happens in the subconscious? They act on your behalf without your conscious control. And that affects, that affects our relationships, that affects how we deal with people, how we deal with our even our work and everything. It's just that we don't realize it's happening, huh? No, we don't because it, it, it's happening for us. Uh, and not out of malice. I mean, the brain is certainly a garbage in, garbage out thing. So it's not doing it out of malice. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't ask our heart to beat because it's a bad thing. It says, that's what I've been programmed to do. And if you put these angry feelings back in me, quite frankly, I'm going to become a naturally angry and bitter man. Yeah, and that, boy, then that affects us, our it whole does. part of us. Well, you well, it, Not only us, but it affects yeah, those around us. Yeah. You wrote another book, a second book, called The Grief Case. The Grief Case, yes, sir. Yeah, what, what is that all about? Does it have something to do, do with dealing with these things? It does. I was so honored to be uh, to be part of a Trinity Broadcast Network uh, television show. And during that show, the word grief uh, popped up. You know, what about Timmy's grief? And what about Tommy's grief? And Sally's grief? And it just popped in my mind. And I very tactfully said, I, I need you to understand that grief is just a container word. You know, I will use grief a thousand times a day, and, and so will you, Ron. But grief is really just a container word. And inside of that word are the emotions of grief. Because if I were to ask you after your loss, Ron, how do you feel, you wouldn't say, well, Ron, I feel grief. You would say, no, I feel angry. I feel sad. I feel lonely. I feel scared. I feel guilty. You're not going to say I feel grief. So as I'm driving back from uh, uh, the Trinity broadcast show, I had a six-hour drive because Trinity asked me if I'd drive to Chattanooga, and I said, absolutely, I would drive to Chattanooga. Um, so... Uh, I guess, I, what is a good visual for that? And instantly in my mind, I thought, if it's a container word, um, then what, what would it be contained in? And then I remember what somebody early on in my grief told me, that I've been handed my grief, and I'm going to carry it with me the rest of my life. And it will be heavy and incredibly burdensome on everything that I do until I can get control of it. And I thought in that car driving home from Chattanooga, what a great analogy for a grief case. It's handed to us many times by somebody that we don't even know. And it's a, a, a case that we are going to carry with us the rest of our life. And inside of that grief case that we can never put down are the, uh, the files. Think of them as manila folders, and each one labeled with anger, fear, confusion, hate, guilt, um, heavy. And they're, they're, they're all confusing and jumbled up at first. 
And when you open up the grief case, there's only one that's organized, and it sits in the very back of the grief case. And the file name on that is Unconditional Love. And that's something that we got from our loved one that we lost. So every time we have a hard time going through the files in the grief case, we can reach back and just put our hands on that one file that says Unconditional Love. And that should give us enough strength to get back down there and go through those manila folders and try to sort out those emotions that we've got. And we never want to, we never want to empty the file completely because, Ron, you became who you are because of what you went through. And God bless you for being who you are. So, I mean, in every one of those folders, we should leave one piece of paper, but one piece of paper only that reminds us of, of that emotion that we went through because I'm going to come up to you and I'm going to ask for help. And, and you're going to be able to go back to that folder and remember that feeling that you had, and you are going to be so willing to help me. And so, so that, as you, yeah, as, as you go on with that grief case, it becomes lighter uh-huh, and lighter, right? And it's all it's going to be with you. So one of the strategies of your book is to to deal with those different areas, mm-hmm. uh, in those Manila folders, right? Uh, those areas of of uh, that are that we describe as grief, but yet are those other internal emotions that are related to it. And as we process that, as we deal with that, then we move to a lighter place, the grief case, you know, like folks like a briefcase, but a grief case gets lighter, Mm -hmm. but yet we have learned. And so now we find a new purpose in our life built around that unconditional love. We do. And that's what's happened to you, hasn't it? It is. It is. I I mean, I've got, uh, and and listen, you know, I, I would be saying a falsehood if I said that, you know, I was way, way far down my journey. Um, this journey for us will never end uh, until we're standing beside our loved one again. But, uh, you know, it gives me a lot of hope knowing that, that my, my grief case is going to get lighter and lighter, and it's going to be less a burden on my life, and I will enjoy walking up to you with that grief case in my hand, just just as I enjoy telling you John's name. Yes, yes. You know, I will I, enjoy it. Yeah, and that's exciting. You know, it, it, that gives us hope, doesn't it? It does. It, and I it, mean, that's really what it is. That's, that's really what your mission is about, giving hope, healing, and, and being there to help others. And if we've got that grief case and realize that we no longer have to stumble over it, but now we can carry it with joy, not joy, that's probably the wrong thing to say, but it, it goes back to that old thing that, that I, I, I wish I wasn't who I am now, but what a blessing to be who I am now. Well, and I think we do find a certain level of joy. Uh, I not think we do. not because we are joyful over the loss of our loved one, but we're joyful over the things we've learned through our loss and the experience that God has brought in our life. How can folks order your books? Can you give us your website? Certainly, it, it's a very simple website. It is uh, www.grievingmen, all one word, grievingmen.com, or uh, they can go on Amazon uh, or uh, you know, all the ebook uh, sites out there. Uh, but it, it's in print too. So grievingmen.com. Yes, sir. Ron, thank you so much for coming on the program. I know you've uh, been an encouragement to the dads, but also to the ladies. Uh, They've been able to better understand their men and what they're going through. And that's what this program is all about, helping folks process and work through their grief. And folks, I'd encourage you to send people to our website, hopehealinghelp.com, to learn more. Remember our scripture that we always refer to, May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. This program has been designed to give you hope for your future, healing for your grief, and help on your journey. And we believe that this today, our time with Ron, has done that. God bless you.